Hello. Uh, in this video, we're going to be talking about doing power analysis for experiments. Uh, now, we're talking about experiments here. We're talking about randomized control experiments. And one of the things about experiments is that you have some control over how big your sample is. Uh, this is unlike in observational studies that we've been spending most of our time working on, where you know it might be good to know uh, what the statistical power of your, of your analysis is going to be, and you probably should try to figure it out before you do your analysis. But there's only so much it can tell. All it can really tell you to do is go ahead or walk away. Uh, in experiments, you can use your power analysis to try to figure out how big your sample size should be, or whether an experiment is worth doing at all, of course. Uh, which means it's a lot more vital that you have to do a power analysis before you do any sort of experiment, because otherwise you're going to end up making some really terrible and really expensive mistakes. So. What is a power analysis? So first of all, we know that we are talking about statistical power and in more, specific, more generally, precision. Precision of your estimate. We know that, that, sample, that, that uh, estimates have a sampling variation, right? If you do the same analysis on the same group, on the same population, uh, over and over and over again with different samples, you're going to get different answers every single time. Sometimes you're going to get answers that are higher than other times. Sometimes you're going to get answers that are lower than other times. On average, you're going to get the population estimate if you're doing a good analysis. But there's going to be variation from time to time. So the question is, uh, given that we have the sampling variation, uh, how much sampling variation can we handle? Uh, so if we are doing an experiment and we want to have a good chance of finding an effect if it's there, that's what we're interested in. Let's say that we are pretty certain that there is an effect there. How many observations do we need to collect to have a good chance of finding it? Because we know if we don't collect enough, even if the effect is truly there, we might not see it. Right? Even for something that's really, really obvious, like let's say, oh, does a, does a parachute help you if you fall out of a plane? Right? What's the effect of wearing a parachute on your survival from a plane fall? Okay? Now, we could gather two observations and then just look at them, but uh, maybe it just so happens that we pulled a person who had a parachute and died anyway, and also a person who didn't have a parachute but miraculously survived. Right? Small samples, weird things can happen. We're pretty certain that that parachute helps you, but our sample was so small that we just so happened to get a weird result. So that's the question. How many observations do we need to be pretty sure that the result that we get is going to reflect the actual effect that's there, if indeed there is an effect there of the size that we think? And that's what power analysis is all about. It's asking uh, what needs to be the case uh, in order for us, to, how many observations do we need to have to find an effect of a certain size? Or conversely, uh, how large does the effect need to be for us to be able to find it with a certain number of observations? Okay. So that's what power analysis is. Uh, the idea here, and the, the really trade-off here that you need to think about is that the smaller the effect is, or the harder it is to find, the more observations we're going to need to find it. Right? So if you are looking for the effect of a parachute on your survival from a plane fall, you know you need you probably want more than two people, but you probably don't need that many people to figure out whether it works or not. Right? You could probably do with like four. Right? That'd be plenty. Uh, but um, uh, for a much smaller effect, you're going to need a lot more people. So if you want to know, for example, hey, does taking this pill uh, increase your lifespan by a day 10 years from now? Well, you know, that's a much smaller effect. Uh, and there's a lot more variation in other things that are going on besides the pill. Uh, the pills, the effect is very, very small. And so the effect of the pill is going to be swamped by the effect of all that other variation. So we actually want to see that effect. We're going to need millions of people to try to take this pill uh, in order to actually see what's going on. So that's the trade-off. How difficult is it to find? How many people do we have? Uh, and uh, how, how big is the effect itself? And then we can offset that against how sure do we want to be? Do we want to have an 80% chance of finding out that the pill works? Uh, if it does work, do we want to have a 90% chance? And then that's going to also affect how many people we're going to need to, to do it. So the things you're going to want to think about when you're doing a power analysis are this. What's the size of the effect that we expect there to be? And we need to theorize about this ahead of time uh, because we, we have to make a guess. We have to make some sort of assumption about how big we think this effect might be. Uh, the sample size, that's the second one. How much variation is there going to be in the treatment? If we see the treatment moving around a lot, uh, then we're going to you know, be able to see it a lot more easily than if we only apply the treatment to a couple of people and most people don't get it. Right? If we're doing our skydiving experiment, uh, but you know the ethics people have 
refused to let us push people out of planes without parachutes, uh, you know, we would not have a lot of variation in treatment because we would be giving everybody a parachute anyway. We would not be able to find the effect very easily. So now those are three things. We also need to think about how much uh, statistical power we want. What, what do we want the probability to be that we will find a statistically significant effect if indeed it is as large as our effect that we've assumed to be? And then, of course, the sample size. So there's five things to consider with power analysis. And the way that it works is that you assume four of them, and then you see what the fifth can be. So you can say things like, okay, for if the effect is actually this large, and there's actually this much variation in treatment, and there's actually this much other stuff going on, how much other noise is there, uh, and, um, and this is how much statistical power we want, how many observations do we need to make that a case? That would be called the minimum sample size necessary to find your effect, or have a good chance of finding your effect. We can go with other directions too. Uh, another common one is the minimum detectable effect. So for a given sample size and a given amount of variation in treatment and a given amount of other variation and a given statistical power, how big does the effect need to be for us to find it? If we have 200 people to randomize to do something, right? We're not going to have enough people to figure out what's the effect of that pill that raises your life by a, 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 a day in a couple of years. Uh, we're going to have more people than we need to figure out the effect of parachutes. But what, what is the smallest effect that we could find, right? Is, that an, is 200 enough people to find the effect of saving an additional 1% on your retirement? Uh, or is that going to be enough to find out the effect of drinking an extra glass of wine a day, right? How big does the effect need to be for us to be able to identify it? So that's the idea of power analysis. How can we actually do power analysis? There's two main ways that we can do it. The first one is to use a calculator. Uh, there are a lot of calculators out there that will do a power analysis for you as long as the power analysis that you're doing is a fairly standard one. So if you're just saying, hey, I have two groups, I'm gonna randomize the groups, uh, and then I assume that here's the effect, I assume that here's how much noise there is, uh, how, much, how many people do I need? Right? If it's as simple as that, then you can use something like powerandsamplesize.com or the G Power, uh, that's G Star Power software, and these can both do power analyses for you. Um, so, for example, uh, let's say that I want to have, uh, I want to see if an effect uh, that is 1 60th of a standard deviation of the variation. So, how much of the effect is there? It's 1 60th of a standard deviation. Uh, so, that if there are 59 60ths of the variation in the outcome is just noise that's unrelated to the effect. So this is a tiny effect, um, and I'm going to evenly randomize people, so that's going to tell me how much variation in treatment there is, uh, and I want to have an 80% chance to find the effect. Well, I've settled everything. How many people do I need? I need 56,397 people to find that effect of 1 60th of a standard deviation. That's a lot. Uh, and so that's, that's, and that's probably even a bigger effect than, let's say, the pill that makes you live an extra day in 10 years would be. So we would need a lot of people to figure out that study. So we can use a calculator as long as we're doing something standard. Another way that I like to do it is with simulation. So with a way that power analysis works with simulation is you try to, and, and this is good because it, it lets you mimic however you think your treatment's going to work. So if it's more complex than just, hey, I randomized two groups, if it is instead something like, hey, I randomized this block of people against this block of people against this block of people, uh, or something more complex like that, uh, what simulation allows you to do is it says, I, I'm going to assume that I have an idea of how this data is generated and how I'm assigning treatment. So I'm going to randomly generate some data with those properties. I'm going to do my analysis. I'm going to see if it's significant or not. And then I'm going to redo the analysis and generate the data over and over and over and over and over again. And I'm going to see how, what percentage of them are significant. And then I can uh, see, okay, well, uh, I, let's say I had 80% of them were significant. I have 80% power. Well, at what sample size did I, did I use in my simulation? Because you can choose what the sample size is as you randomly generate the data. How many random observations are you going to generate? Uh, and you can also choose what the effect size is, right? What effect did you plug into the data when you generated it? You have to you have to choose how the effect size, right? You are in effect when you create the data, you're going to say, "Hey, here's the treatment. I'm going to assume that getting the treatment increases your outcome by this amount." Uh, and so you randomly generate the data with the properties that you want, with the with uh, all those properties that you wanted. Uh, you see whether it's significant or not, and then you do it over and over again, and then you fiddle with the things like the effect size and the sample size to figure out how much sample size you need and how much effect size you can handle. I'm not going to go through the technical details of how to do this because it's a bit more than you can really handle. It doesn't, it's not, doesn't lend itself to a video format, but I will post a link in the description uh, to a uh, way that I've walked through how to do this power analysis by simulation. All right, that's the basic idea of power analysis. Uh, we want to know, basically, given how noisy the world is, how, given how big our effect is, given how much treatment variation there is, given what we want our statistical power to be, our chance of finding an effect if it's true, 
And our sample size, well, if we know four of those things, we can figure out what the fifth one can be. And through that, we can figure out how big we need our experiment to be. Is it too big to feasibly fund, for example? Uh, or if we have a fixed size for our experiment, how big does that effect need to be for us to find it? Uh, if we think that given our 200 people, uh, we can't possibly find the effect of the pill that doesn't affect it in 10 years, then we probably shouldn't run that study because it is underpowered. And if we run that study anyway, even though it's underpowered and we still get a significant result, that kind of suggests actually that we got a false positive. Because if our statistical power is very low, that means that we have a low chance of finding the result if it's actually there. Which means that the share of times when we find a positive result, when we find a significant result, uh, the share of times when that's a false positive is higher than the share of times when it's a false and it's a true positive. And so uh, we will be more likely to have gotten a bad result with a low power study, even if it is significant. All right, that's it. Thank you.